Welcome once again. Welcome once again to Too Much TV. I'm your host, Brian Levinson. Today we have a very exciting lineup. Uh, our guests include Kay Mockley Antonelli, who worked on the uh, first computer, senior captain of the Pointe Waymars baseball team, Rob Reed, and a teacher here at Pointe Waymars High School, Mr. Ray McMahon. And I'm here now with uh, Kay Mockley Antonelli, who uh, worked on the first computer. And uh, actually, this is the 50th anniversary of the invention of the computer, which is, uh, took place in Philadelphia. And uh, why do you think Philadelphia was the home, place the home base of the computer? Well, the reason it was where, why the computer was built here was because the computer, as you know, was a wartime project. And uh, long before the computer was even thought of being built, the, the Aberdeen Proving Grounds of Maryland had asked the University of Pennsylvania to set up a program whereby uh, people would compute firing tables for the Army. And this project was going on at the University of Pennsylvania where Eckert and Mockley were located. And when they saw this project going on, they uh, took up and suggested to the Army an idea that had been Mockley's for about 10 years of building an electronic computer. And uh, the Army bought that and uh, gave them a contract to build the computer. And that's why it landed up in Philadelphia, because that's where they were. <laughs> How did it feel to be working on this project? Well, uh, the computer, was, an, although it was a wartime project and was being built during the war, it actually never saw the light of day till after the war had already ended. And uh, just I was one of those women who had been hired to compute uh, firing tables. And uh, as the war wound down, the Army, knowing that the ENIAC was coming up, asked us, uh, there were a group of five women, if we would like to learn how to program this m new machine that was being built. So we did, and it was a very exciting time. One of the most exciting things about it was that the very first problem that was ever put on the ENIAC was the feasibility of the H-bomb, which was Dr. Teller and Dr. Fermi's problem from, uh, at, from the uh, Los Alamos project. So it, from the, the day it first started, it was exciting. Now, how do you think life would be different without computers? Well, there's no going back. I mean, you can't imagine life without a car, so it would be this, about the same thing, I think. It was, it's changing our lives in the same way, I think, that the uh, car changed our lives. Now, you had married uh, John Mockley, who was one of the main inventors of the computer. Um, did he have any other ideas he wanted to pursue as a, an inventor? Oh, Mockley always had a million ideas that he wanted to pursue. But uh, the reason that he had ever first started to uh, think about having an electronic calculator was because the speed which electronics would give him. And the problems that he were interest, was interested in was forecasting the weather. Now, I just don't mean day-to-day uh, -day weather, but I mean global weather, whether you could forecast uh, droughts or hurricanes or things of that magnitude that affect the whole, the whole earth. And uh, that was his dream until the day he died. He was still trying to forecast the weather much better than the Weather Bureau could do, I'd say. <laughs> Is there uh, anything you think that would be misunderstood about the invention of the computer? Well, there are a lot of people who don't understand exactly what the ENIAC was. And the ENIAC, I think, has always been uh, sold itself as the first general purpose fully automatic electronic computer. Now, there were lots of other computers being built. I mean, it was an age when people were thinking of, of speeding up calculations or even doing, doing calculations automatically. So although computers were being built, some of them were not electronic, some of them were not automatic, some of them were not multi-purpose, any purpose. Uh, so uh, you have to really define ENIAC rather narrowly, and then you know exactly what the computer was all about. But uh, so there have been various claims laid to being the first computer. But if you describe it as uh, electronic and, uh, and uh, general purpose, then I think you get the idea that today's computers are the su true successors of ENIAC. Now, when did you finally realize that the computer would be turning into something like this? Did you, I'm sure you always realized it was just something like maybe a few people would be using, but when did you finally realize it would be something that everyday use? Well, when you realize that uh, the ENIAC itself was in a room 80 feet, it was actually a machine that was 80 feet long, 
And that was my first exposure to an electronic calculator. So it was hard to envision at any time then uh, what the desk calculator would be like, a desk computer would be like. But uh, Mockley and Eckert went on to invent Univac, uh, which was a m very much smaller machine, but did a hundred times more than the ENIAC did. So you see the idea of miniaturization was already there from the very beginning. But uh, we just, d they had electronic tubes were about five inches in size, which got b replaced by a transistor, which is about a quarter of an inch square. And in no time at all, a handheld desk, uh, handheld calculating machine could do as much work as the ENIAC itself could do. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you for joining us here on Too Much TV. Yeah. Thank and, you. And uh, we'll be back after this break. and thieves with a microscope. Help your daughter become a scientist. Instead of a tea set, get her a chemistry set. Look at the boring job I got from being a science nerd. Expect the best from a girl. That's what you'll get. Back to Too Much TV. I'm Brian Levinson. I'm here now with uh, senior captain of the Porth Wymore Space Ball Team, Rob Reed. I well, thank you for joining us here, Rob. Thank you. Okay, uh, you know you're a dual athlete. Play football, baseball, maybe other things. Um, what sport do you enjoy the most playing? Well, uh, it it all depends on what season it is. You know, during football, I like to concentrate on football and not have to worry about my baseball duties and. Uh, you know, vice versa, you know, when it's baseball season, I don't want to have to worry about football, you know. Um, right now, um, my football career is is finished, but uh, I'm going to miss it a lot. Um, so right now, I can just concentrate on one sport and hopefully carry that through as far as I can. Now, let's start with uh, football. Uh, once again, Port Weimar's had a terrific season, mm -hmm. went far into the playoffs. Uh, what do you think can be attributed to that? Well, the one thing that was, that stood out in my mind was the way that the team worked together. You know, everybody was backing each other up, you know. Uh, everybody was helping each other out. And, you know, if somebody made a mistake, you know, they really didn't worry about it too much because they knew that they had other people backing them up and trying to get them through it. But, um, you know, when, when, when the team works like the way we did, you know, you end up with the record that we ended up with. So One of the things I, I noticed was a lot of personalities on the team, a lot of characters, uh, oh, probably yeah. molded together, made a more comfortable atmosphere. Well, there was a lot of clowns, play. a lot of clowns. Including yourself. Uh, not <laughs> well, sometimes, not really, but, uh, it... <laughs> okay. Uh, what do you think uh, is your most memorable, uh, memorable moment from that season? I'm sure you're going to remember a lot of things, but I'm sure there's one thing that sticks well, out. Well, the one thing that stuck out of my mind was the, uh, well, obviously the CB West game because they haven't been shut out in 12 years since uh, I can't remember when they said it was like 80 or something. Um, you know, obviously beating CB West was phenomenal. Um, moving on in the state playoffs was was uh, you know was fun and playing against a kid like James Mungro from East Strasburg. I mean, you were there, you saw him play. Unbelievable. The kid is, I mean, it's amazing. You know, and hopefully, you know, five or ten years from now, I can maybe watch him on television and say that I played against him. You know, maybe I took him down a couple times, but <laughs> maybe a couple times you missed him too. A couple times I missed him too, <laughs> exactly. Um, but the one thing that stood in my mind was, uh, you know, every day in, every day was in and out. You know, every day we had to go out and practice. We, you know, I felt like I was with the same guys for at least four months. It all started in August and ended in December. I mean, that's a, it's a long season, and 
we had a lot of fun. Now, uh, moving on to baseball, which is probably your more dominant sport, would you say? Uh, yeah, I, I played baseball a lot longer than I played football. Um, you know, two years ago when Portland White Marsh won the uh, state championship team, that must have been, well, you know, like phenomenal. Like, how, yeah. did, how did it feel to be on it? You know, well, one of the top 50 teams in the country? I think we were ranked sixth in sixth, the nation. Yeah. Um, the thing that stood out in my mind right now is I can, I couldn't really relate to it back when I was a sophomore because I was so young and inexperienced. Um, now that I'm a senior, I can. I can really relate to that because I know that the, the competition, because I didn't really play as a sophomore, the competition now is just, um, it's unreal. You know, everybody's out to, to beat you. Everybody out, is out to you know, play good against you. And, you know, you, you have to, you know, live up to what you're expected to live up to be. And, um, but now, I mean, I, I didn't realize how much work went into going 26-2 and two in 94. It was, it was a lot. But once again, it was, it was one of the memorable moments. You know, I can always... Remember, you know, staying in hotels, getting out of school at 9 o'clock in the morning, going, taking buses. <laughs> you know, I mean, I always remember that. All the stuff we got, we got watches, certificates, hats, shirts, all kind of stuff. It was fun. Now, uh, recently you signed uh, to play for uh, St. Joseph's University next year with a full scholarship. Uh, mm -hmm. What made you choose them? Like, better looking girls or? No, <laughs> well, I, well, not really because St. Joe's is only uh, a, a school of only about 2,500 students. Um, they don't have a football team. Um, the uh, the baseball team came in contact with me. I think it was in late February. The uh, the coach Lachelle from St. Joe's came to school, and Coach Demito called me down in his office, and we sat there and talked for at least an hour and a half. And uh, you know he, he offered me a full scholarship, and he was telling me all about his program and, and how they play. Um, I went home and I thought about it for at least three or four weeks. We talked with my parents. I mean. Picking a college to go to is, is, is serious. Tough decision, sure. It is, and um, I finally came to the decision. I called him up. I let him know what I want to do, and you know, recently I've gone to about three or four of their games, and I'm really excited. First of all, because it's it's close. Um, it's it, it's a good baseball program. It's Division One. Um, coach Lasciavo, he went to Plymouth White Marsh himself. He played for under Coach Demito. Um, he, he knows the Colettas. You know, so it's, I, I kind of feel like it's a family thing, and that's, oh, that's what I want to, you know, be involved with. No, we'd be going right in and playing right away, or? Well, that's, he said um, he'll have an, I'll have a, definitely an opportunity to, to play. Um, he said he's not going to, like, you know, give out scholarships to people who, who aren't going to play. Um, but he said definitely because they're losing, uh, I'd say, about a quarter of, of the team this year. Hmm. And they're losing all their outfielders, and... Uh, you know, I could play, you know, other than catcher, I can play the outfield. So, other than that, I think I'll have a lot of playing time. No, uh, a lot of you might not know this, but last year you actually had a trial with the New York Mets. What was that like? Well, I, uh, I got a letter in the mail. It had a uh, New York Mets emblem on it, and I didn't really know what to expect. I opened it up, and it really, what it did, it scared me, because I didn't know, you know, what it was. I didn't know if it was a joke. I didn't know if it was, <laughs> uh, you know, if it was legit. So I called up Coach Demito and he explained it to me. And he said, you know, your junior year, you're going to have, you know, you got to get the most exposure you can, mm -hmm. because by your senior year, you're going to have to pick a, a school that you want to go to. So I, uh, I went up there um, to Shea Stadium in New York, and there was people, there were players from New York, Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania. It was only uh, uh, 38, I think, players. And uh, what he did is that they. Uh, we had a tryout, you know, we got to hit, catch, throw, you know, just have fun on, on a major league ballpark, and that's what we did. Unfortunately, it rained for the last 20 minutes, and we just, we called it quits, but that's another thing I remember the most is playing on a major league ballpark. Now, would you eventually like to play professional ball after college? Well, everybody would, you know. I mean, I mean, when you were, you know, a kid, you know, you always say you want to play professional ball, and, you know, as you get older, you realize that it's, it's hard to do that. Um, you know, hopefully I can go into college, I can, I can, uh, play, you know, what I'm capable of playing and maybe maybe get drafted or whatnot. But, you know, we ought to see what happens. I'm, I'm really concerned about what I want to major in so I have something to fall back on. Sure. And, uh, you know, we'll have to see what happens. And what's, like, the craziest thing that's happened, like, playing baseball? The craziest thing that's happened? Like, this sort of some crazy things that's happened. You know, a couple <sighs> wild stories, like talking junk to the batters from behind the plate. Well, it's, it's fun talking because I know a lot of kids from around, you know, around the area and, uh, you know, I know people from, you know, here at Wissahickon. I know kids from Upper Marion, Shotham. I know them all. 
And, uh, you know, I, I like to talk to them when they contemplate, maybe have, you know, some fun. Gain their head a little. A yeah. little bit, you know. But, I mean, it's fun because, you know, you have more friends, not just on your team, but you have, you know, friends on the other team that you're competing with, you know. And, you know, a lot of time you don't let that get in the way. But, you know, at the end of the game, you can still shake hands and, and tell the other person that they did a good job. Now, do you have, like, a specific uh, inspirational figure that you uh, like to think about? Uh, well, everybody... Uh, First of all, you know, my, my coach, Tomito, he, uh, he helped me get into uh, school. You know, he always helps, helps the kids get into school. Um, and most of all is, you know, my teammates. You know, I mean, we got other players like Paul Brashevitz, Scott Amon, you know, Vinny Kieser, he's coming up, he's, he's doing well. And, um, you know, it, the teammates is what ha is, that's how we got so far in football. That's how we got so far in baseball. It's, you know, if you don't have your teammates, you can't do anything. And, and that's what I have to, uh, you know, my inspirational is, is from my teammates. Now, uh, if you eventually do become famous, you already pretty much have a famous name, uh, <laughs> same name as the uh, lead star of the Brady Bunch. Uh, Anyone ever confused it for him? Well, a lot of people, you know, when they first meet me, they, they always say, did anybody tell you that, you know, the father of the Brady Bunch had the same name? I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't really bother me. I, I think it's funny, you know. I, I, you know, if you see the Brady Bunch and I see my name up there, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's all right. It doesn't bother me too much. Okay, well, like, thank you for joining thank us, you. Rob. Rob Reed. <laughs> Not the Brady Bunch store, the other Rob Reed. Uh, and we'll be back at this on Too Much TV. That is perhaps the greatest tragedy in life. When you support the United Negro College Fund, you give more than money. You give dreams that may have died. The power to live. Math, a four-letter word, right? Hey, you don't need that. Why design the world's newest chips? <laughs> when you could be flipping the world's oldest burgers. Hey, wait a minute. This is math. Geometry, algebra. No pocket protectors here. But you're cruising without math. Yeah, right. Take a good look. That's math staring back at you. It's not a problem, man. It's an answer. Call NACME. We'll tell you what you need to do. In America, you are not required to offer food to the hungry or shelter to the homeless. There is no ordinance forcing you to visit the lonely. In fact, nowhere in the Constitution does it say you have to provide anything for anybody. Thank you for all you've given. Imagine what more could do. We're back on Too Much TV. I'm Brian Levinson. I'm joined now with uh, Mr. Ray McMahon, who's a teacher at Point Lloyd Marsh High School. And uh, first, I'd like to ask you, I mean, uh, what made you get started in teaching? Uh, well, um, when I was in high school, I played a lot of sports. Uh, I did some coaching. Uh, I was involved with uh, Baltimore Orioles uh, scouting a little bit and some of their summer camps. And I really enjoyed working with kids and uh, had talked to my health teacher about uh, possibly a career. And I started going to you know different classes and observing him. And, and it led to going to Westchester State College, which is now Westchester University. And that's where I graduated from. And uh, 32 years later, I'm still doing it. <laughs> what would you say is the funnest part of your job? What do you enjoy the most? Besides having to put up with kids like me. <laughs> well, I just, I like to be involved with, with the kids. I think that uh, um, to, to be involved with them and, and see their, their growth. I do a lot of teaching at 10th grade uh, health classes. And in my classes, uh, we do community service. Um, uh, we just had uh, Rob Reed on. He was uh, uh, in my 10th grade class. Uh, now he's a senior. We do a thing with flower babies where they have to carry uh, 
you know, they take a five pound bag of flour, and dress it up, arms, legs, the whole thing. It was always an interesting time in school, you know. Carry it for a month with 150 kids doing that. And then I do a, um, a project with a scrapbook of their life, trying to, uh, you know, go back through their years, let them piece together what they need to do. And, and, and this is now a time in their lives where they're really going to start making important decisions. And I think that feeling good about yourself and, and knowing that you are, you know, have some goals to go to. And if I can help them with those goals and get them to go that way, that, that's what's fun for me. And, and um, I'm kind of old fashioned in my beliefs and, and, and try to put some of those things in there too. Now, as you said, you were uh, teaching for a number of years. Like, I'm sure you have a couple interesting stories uh, in your past. Well, I taught a lot of elementary physical education before I came to the high school uh, three years ago. And I can remember I was teaching at uh, Ridge Park Elementary School quite a few years ago, and we were playing a game. It's kind of like an indoor hockey game. It's called Pillow Polo and the big Remember fat that? things on the end of the stick. And, and, and we had 17 little kids in the class, and so I made the 18th because I, I, I play with three, uh, six kids on the side, so we made three teams, and I was out playing with the kids, and then it was my, my, my team was to sit down, and I put the other two teams on there, and little boy Joey sitting next to me, and little blonde curly here, I'll never forget, he said, he said, Mr. McMahon, he said, I love this game. And I said, well, that's good, Joe. He said, <laughs> he said, but this is my favorite game. And I said, well, that's great. And he said, you know, he said, uh, so someday he said, I, I want to be a gym teacher like you. And I said, oh, no, I was getting all pumped up. Oh, this is great. He said, after all, he said, I, I feel like I could do that until I could get a real job. <laughs> and, and I just thought, you know, what they picture you, that I came and played games all day long. You know, I, I wasn't a teacher. I was just there to have fun. A elaborate babysitter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, now, also now, you, they started a thing at PW now called the Gym Show, and you're one of the coordinators in that. Now, uh, want to explain kind of like what it is, pretty much? We, um, I think all of us in, in, in all of our fields need to let the public kind of know what we're doing. And uh, I was asked to coordinate a district-wide uh, gym show that'll be from kindergarten through 12th grade. It's going to take place on May 30th, and it'll probably involve about seven or 800 boys and girls from uh, our whole school district. Uh, the high school is working very hard on a couple numbers. It'll be, it, it's it's going to be a real kind of a spectacular show. It'll be in the big gym where they hold the basketball games. So we're expecting a couple thousand people. And um, it gives an opportunity for uh, the community to understand that, you know, um, our physical education program is important, why it's important, and it's it's a character builder for some kids. And, and I think that's what's really neat. And we've got kids doing dances all over the place. and and a few other things, and uh, uh, it'll be pretty spectacular, I think. I'll have to know, yeah. <laughs> you often let me know the day, so I'm going to start scalping tickets out there, you know. Oh, absolutely. And Ten bucks a head, why not, you know. <laughs> now, uh, on a more serious note, you also started a, a project called Project Band, and uh, that's basically, uh, you know, having students take a pledge for one month that they won't use any alcohol or drugs, and what made you want to start something like that? Well, Ryan, unfortunately, um, uh, students in our high school know I uh, had a 17-year-old son this December who was hit by a car and killed uh, seven days before his 18th birthday. And um, Chris was a tremendous soccer player. He was headed to Division I. Um, and he was making some bad decisions. And two years ago, he was involved in a boating accident. He almost lost his foot. And yet, uh, wasn't supposed to play his junior year. He came back and played the first game against Great Valley to a state innovation. Um, it's still an amazing thing to the trainers how he ever rehabilitated himself. But in that process, um, I'll be honest and say somebody introduced him to pot uh, because he was in so much pain. And it grew. And we don't know whether Christopher was somewhere between still experimenting to a habit. But we know that, that those decisions and some things like that led to this tragedy. And I just feel very close to students and what I do as a teacher. And I thought there needs to be something else. So I sat down one day and thought, I've got to come up with something and, and came up with this idea. Now, I didn't come up with a name, Project Band. It came from one of our students. But basically, what the kids do is they sign a pledge not to use any drugs, illegal drugs or alcohol, for a month at a time. And we put a band like this. We're using the, um, Embroidery floss, we tie it on their either wrist or ankle. It's a very private thing. No one knows names. Uh, we publish the number of students who sign the pledge. If any time during that month they use for any reason, then they cut the band off. I know that they've shown a lot of respect for that. 
Uh, our numbers even dropped off a little this past month because students said, well, we knew of some big parties coming up and they did. So they showed respect for it, but at the same time, we start sure. to question why they need to go out to a party and do that. Um, we'd like to see that um, uh, it keep growing, that uh, one of our areas to touch upon are the students who don't use any kind of alcohol or drugs at all. We want them to symbolize by being part of that and wearing the band. Their feeling is, I don't do anything, why do I need to do that? And we're trying to show the numbers so that um, you know it, it can grow and we do have kids really showing a tremendous respect for the program. And it gives, and I guess one of the reasons is that it gives the kids an opportunity. Now they have an excuse when they go to a party not to drink or use drugs because if somebody says, how come you're not drinking? They can say, uh, I signed a pledge. And maybe next month I'll, I'll be okay to party, but I'm going to honor that pledge and I'm going to show respect for that. And it's showing respect to me because I think they, they know what I've gone through in, in this year. And at the same time, it's going to help some kids. And now we're going to try to buddy up. And you know, if, if I did it for a month, now take your best buddy and, and help them through 30 days. And it sounds crazy. I've been to a drug rehab center. I'm going in to start talking to parents of kids who are uh, rehabbing um, simply because of the tragedy I've gone through. Uh, I know I can't bring Chris back again, but somehow I need to make sure that his memory, for me, carries on and helps other kids. Now, offhand, do you have uh, the number of students who have signed the pledge? Uh, we were just a little bit under 500 out of 1,300 in our school the first month, and it dropped off a little less than that this past month. So it's only two months old. Um, we'd like to see it carried beyond Plymouth White Marsh High School. We think we need to get down into the middle school. And hopefully, if this really works, we'd like to take this across the state and maybe across the country. I mean, there's a need for it. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's now in the hands of our students. I mean, I, I, the students give the bands. Um, they sign the pledges. They take care of cutting things off and so on. I don't know who, when, or where. I just, I just, I just look at the numbers because uh, it's a personal thing. Now, being like an inspirational figure to a lot of students at uh, Point Way Marsh, do you plan on any other type of activities sort of like that to kind of like lead them down the right road? Well, I think that you have to keep Without preaching to them, you have to keep them reminding them that the decisions they make, um, you know, Rob sat here a few minutes ago and said how, you know, he had to think about weeks and weeks about making a decision for baseball. Um, every decision you make as a teenager can affect you. And we all make bad decisions, all right? And we just hope that it never gets to the point where um, it ends in a tragedy. And I know what it's like to go through that. And, you know, it's, I think to, to just, be honest with them, and, and I think that's what I try to do with the kids, and I think maybe that's why they show the respect to me, is, is I, I'm always there to listen to them, and, and I don't shut the door on them, and I wanna, want them to know that I respect them and what, what they do. Yeah, I think uh, it's definitely a positive thing to address the situation is with the drugs and alcohol. I'm sure there's people you know, that may think that, like, oh, there's, we don't have a problem, we don't need to address it, but rather being honest and saying there is a problem, trying to address it that way would be better. Yeah, I don't think on a, on a large scale that we have uh, a lot of kids that are running around that are alcoholics and drug addicts, but we have a lot of kids that are trying and experimenting, and it only takes one bad incident, okay, to possibly take somebody's life. Sure. And, and that's where the danger comes in. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Mr. Ray McMahon. And we'll be back to close right after this on Too Much TV. 42% of all murdered women are killed by men who promise to love them. Help stop domestic violence. Call us. More interesting guests, maybe? Or I don't know who we're going to have next time, to tell you the truth. We won't have Ray on again. I'll come back. Another, another guest. For all you ladies out there, he will be signing autographs in the Coral Lounge. My uh, number should be running at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> yeah, that, this might be a time to turn it off now when the when, when number's on. But thanks for joining us, Ray. And thank, uh, you, thank uh, all you for joining us here on Too Much TV. For all the cast and crew, cast and crew, where am I on the stage? For all the crew here at Too Much TV, I'm Brian Levinson. Thanks a lot for joining us.